Hello, my name is Will Rycroft and welcome to a very special episode of the Waterstones podcast in which we will be celebrating the six authors who are shortlisted for the inaugural Waterstones Debut Fiction Prize. This is a prize which has been created to celebrate novel fiction in all its forms across genres uh, by asking Waterstones booksellers to champion their favourite new voices. Now, rather than me droning on for minutes uh, to introduce each of our six authors who are becoming aware of each other's shortlisted status for the very first time right now, um, I'm going to ask them to actually introduce themselves and their books in true elevator pitch style. Uh, and so working alphabetically, as any good bookseller should, we shall begin with Bonnie Garmus. Welcome, Bonnie. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the name of my book is Lessons in Chemistry. It's about a woman chemist in the late 1950s, early 1960s. Her name is Elizabeth Zott. She's fictional. And she gets fired from her job because she's unwed and pregnant. She ends up taking, very reluctantly taking, a job as a TV cookery show host. But instead of teaching the average housewives at home cooking, she teaches them chemistry. Because, you know, cooking is chemistry. But in doing so, she ends up changing the way they view themselves and changing lives. She becomes a, a catalyst for change. And the viewership goes from men and women to children and beyond. And everyone starts listening to her. Fantastic. So we move on now to Tess Gunty. Hi, I'm Tess Gunty. I'm the author of The Rabbit Hutch. And I think of this novel as an ode to the post-industrial American Midwest, which is where I was born and raised. The novel takes place in a fictional dying city in Indiana, and it follows a group of characters over the course of three days as their lives violently collide. And most of these people live in the same housing complex, and at the center is a young woman who's recently aged out of foster, kiss, foster care and has developed an obsession with the Catholic female mystics. See, these, these elevator pitches are immediately intriguing. I'm loving this. Um, we're going to move on now to Louise Kennedy. Um, okay, so my novel is called Trespasses, and it's set um, in a small town um, near Belfast in 1975, um, which is a place in time that I that I you know I lived in uh, in Belfast at that time. Uh, that's where I grew up, and um, it's about a young Catholic school teacher called Kushla, who uh, helps out in the family pub in the evenings, um, and it's there that she meets um, an older married Protestant man and uh, begins an affair. And um, uh, 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 running alongside the affair, um, Kushna develops a relationship with a, a little boy who she teaches um, when his father is violently attacked. And um, these two um, sort of threads uh, collide fairly drastically uh, towards, the, towards the end. Thank you, Louise. Um, we move on now to Sequoia Nagamatsu. Hi, I'm Sequoia Nagamatsu. I'm a writer and professor based in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and the author of How High We Go in the Dark. Um, How High We Go in the Dark is a multi-generational journey about community and embracing the possibilities for life in the aftermath of a global tragedy. The novel kicks off in Siberia in 2030, where scientists have unearthed the 30,000-year-old remains of a girl who may not be completely human, along with an unusual virus. The following years follow a cast of intricately linked characters who navigate what comes to be known as the Arctic Plague. Very topical. An employee at a theme park designed to provide euthanasia services via roller coaster, a painter on an interstellar starship, a deceased mother's robotic dog, a telepathic organ donor pig, and present in many of these journeys are hints at another character whose journey began billions of years ago. Ultimately, this is a story about connections, memory, and reimagining the best versions of who we can be when most of what we've had has been lost. Fantastic introduction, Sequoia. Thank you so much. And we move on now to Ella Hossa. Hi, my name is Ella Hossa Osunji, and I'm the author of Vagabond, which is a novel set in Lagos, Nigeria. Um, Vagabond is a novel or a collection of st short stories, depending on who you ask, um, about queerness, freedom, and making a life for yourself in a city that's difficult um, when you're making that life from the margins. Yeah. Thank you so much, Hello, sir. And our final author is Tara M. Stringfellow. Hey, y'all. I'm Tara. I wrote the novel Memphis. Um, it's a story about three generations of Memphis women in one house. But truly, I just wanted to write a black fairy tale. 
um, an ode to my city and the black women living there in it, an ode to poor black women, an ode to um, self-educated black women. I don't think that's been done before since the color purple. And really, I wanted to write a book about the hood, how, about how beautiful um, North Memphis can be, the streets that raise me. So that's about it in a nutshell. Fantastic. Thank you so much. So as I've said at the beginning, this is the debut fiction prize. And many people will assume that that means that we're talking purely about sort of young MFA students chucking out their first novel. Everyone has been through a journey towards publication and it's slightly different for each of you. Um, and I would love to hear a little bit about how these books came to be and how you came to be uh, writing them. Um, I'm going to start with you, Louise, because I know that you have had a completely different career for much of your life and that writing is something that you've only recently done, but with great success very quickly. I wonder if you could tell me a little bit about what you were doing before writing and, and how it came to be that you were uh, picking up the pen or putting fingers on a keyboard. Um, so I was a chef for nearly 30 years. I cooked and ran restaurants. And in 2014, when I was 47, a friend uh, bundled me, pretty much bundled me into her car and drove me to um, to join a writing group that she'd been asked to join. And I didn't really understand why. And I had I literally hadn't written anything since I was probably about anything creatively since I was about 11. Um, but I always read a lot. Um, so I started to write uh, short stories and I did that for maybe around four or five years. Um, and then um, I, I got cancer in 2019. And um, I suppose mostly to avoid thinking about whether I might be dying or not, um, I wrote a novel um, to distract myself. So I, I set myself a task to write a thousand words a day for um, about three months when I was off work. So um, I guess that was the first draft of, of Trespass. That's quite an extraordinary journey to, to go on. Uh, and obviously, as you said there, one one reaction to your diagnosis was to to set yourself a challenge. Did you did you find that was helpful, um, not only in, as you said, distracting yourself, but maybe helping you to get through what must have been a very difficult period? Yeah, I mean, I, I um, it's sort of weird because I didn't even think of it as a difficult period at the time. I was just very keen to try and avoid thinking about it at all. And this was a really great way to do it. Um, so um, I have a wee shed in my garden. So um, e every day I'd uh, force myself to go out there and um, and, and type um, a, a thousand words and just to keep going. And the other deal I made with myself was to keep going forward with the draft and not look back, which is something I'd always struggle to do with it short stories but I figured if I did that with a novel I'd never ever finish it um, so yeah I don't know I think I was very lucky that I had something like that to do and uh, yeah I mean I can I have the cancer has since come back I, I'm I'm in treatment again um, and yeah I mean I just think that um, that the, the writing has been a, a great distraction from all of it um, that, uh, that I could enter some kind of uh, uh, fictional worlds and, and hang out with other people who aren't real when uh, real life is a bit um, a bit challenging so yeah Obviously, we wish you all the best, Louise. Um, Thank you. Bonnie, you're somebody else who's who's had a very different career. You've worked as a, a copywriter and a creative director in lots of different mm -hmm. fields, in fact. Mm -hmm. um, how did that lead to you ending up deciding to, to write fiction? Well, I've been, I mean, you know, some people think copywriting is fiction. It's just very short fiction. Um, but but I, I've always wanted to be a writer and I and uh, I had written a novel before this one. And it was a total failure. It was 700 pages long. And I didn't know that a debut author shouldn't write 700 pages. It was like, I missed that, that, that one fact. And um, I got 98 rejections from people saying, you know, 700 pages for a debut, no. So, you know, I cried for about six months and then, um, I started this other novel, Lessons in Chemistry. It was based on, um, well, it's, I would say it was inspired by a bad day at work um, where I started to question whether women had actually moved forward in the world at all. Uh, and so I set the book in the, in, the late six, in the late 50s and early 60s when my mom was a mom. And I got a chance to see what she had endured and what her friends had endured. And it was a lot different from what I thought. Um, but I will say, I think that we've moved forward, not nearly enough. And I think as probably you all know, in the United States, we're very busy going backwards as quickly as possible. Um, and so, yeah, my writing journey was, I think, I think of it as the standard bumpy um, rejection centric um, journey with all the copywriting in between so I can make a living. <laughs> 
always good to have a plan like that if you're going to yes. do it right. <laughs> it's the voice of experience um and also i'm going to come to you next because you're often described as a multidisciplinarian because you work in different forms of of media if you like and i wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what that actually means and and then how that has become vagabonds your your fictional debut okay um so I didn't start making art like professionally until I think six years ago. And what changed for me um, was that right after I finished my degree in industrial economics, I got into a writing workshop in Nigeria and um, was just surrounded by 22 other Nigerian writers. And being in that room um, where stories were the focus and stories were the center, um, I think that there's something about that that just gave me courage um, but I will also say that one of the facilitators um, at the workshop literally said to me on the last day, you should write, forget your other career, you should write. And so that was very straightforward, if there was ever a sign. And so I took that and um, just started, you know, taking my writing more seriously. But I've always written, um, I thought I was going to um, put out nonfiction first, because I my idea of being a published writer was someone who had all of this wisdom to give. So I thought that I would have to wait and experience life and do another career before getting into it. But that was a great surprise just to find that there was another world completely um, where I could play in fiction, where the, the, the point of the stories was imagination more than it was fact. Yeah. Because you're, you, you're a filmmaker too, and yes. in fact, you have a, a, a film that you've made which is connected to Vagabonds. Yes. I wonder how sort of separate those two things are and how connected they are, because obviously they have completely different mediums to work in. But yes. how does that connection work for you? Um, I think that for me, they all bleed out of the same thing. And the, the core for me is story. And so it's just... Am I writing the story or am I um, putting the story on screen? And so that becomes a question for me. But really, the heart of everything I make in every medium I work in is the story. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, Tess, I'm going to come to you now. I, I was uh, not meaning to sound at all disparaging about a Master's of Fine Arts uh, degrees or anything like that. Do you know what I mean, though? That thing where people often assume that debut just means sort of young ingenue, but you, you, you're a writer that's new to me, but you've made such a big impression with The Rabbit Hutch. And I wondered what your journey was to publication. Yeah, I'm really delighted that Waterstones is uplifting all sorts of debut stories because it is it is a little bit depressing in the United States, especially how ubiquitous um, the MFA journey is <laughs> for debut novelists that become elevated. And so I think I do have the, the least interesting story here. I went to a, an MFA right out of college I'd been writing fiction ever since I was really little, but never assumed it was anything I could pursue intentionally or as a career. But I found a funded, um, a funded program, and I I had two years to develop my writing. And I spent the first year writing hundreds of very labored pages that I ultimately threw away, and the second year sort of working on the Rabbit Hutch, which um, I only finished uh, five years later. So it took it took me five years to write it. But by the time I was done, I had been so um, demoralized by the accumulation of rejections that so many of us find inevitable that I decided I'm going to just print it, bind it very nicely, put it on my shelf and write something else. I didn't think anyone would want to read a novel as peculiar as this one. <laughs> and um, and my friend Kate Doyle finally convinced me to submit it to agents, and um, and after that things moved quickly, and a lot of the people who ended up being important to the publication, including my editor, Eric Knopf, John Freeman, um, I met through my MFA program. So it ended up being uh, a long journey, but ultimately kind of bookended by that by that community. A little shout out to your friend then in being the person who. Uh convinced you to, to submit yes she has a short story collection forthcoming from ah there you go <laughs> <laughs> that's what friends are for um fantastic um and sequoia you uh too have, have been through the mfa program but you're a teacher as well um mm -hmm. and uh, i wonder how you balanced sort of the writing for yourself and the teaching for others and and that journey yeah um, I, guess, I guess like Tess, um, you know, I, I didn't come to the MFA 
um, you know, I, ha- I have an MFA, but I didn't come to that program until you know several years after college. I had been living in Japan for for a couple of years after my grandfather had died, and I think for me that was really my first education in writing. Um, I had formed an online community um, with other writers because there weren't any in person workshops that I could attend, and you know, sitting alone in my you know tiny Japanese apartment. Uh, I started writing short stories in order to sort of, I guess, handle the loss of my grandfather. And that's, you know, the earliest seeds of how high we go in the dark. Um, So by the time I, you know, got my MFA, I already had very raw drafts of multiple book projects, Um, you know, including how high we go in the dark, even though I didn't know it, including my next Bloomsbury novel, which has also taken quite a bit of time. Um, You know, being a creative writing professor was something I never expected because those jobs are very few and far between and it's very competitive to get these jobs. So I never expected to make a living teaching writing. Um, And I think I was just very lucky to have published a short story collection when I needed a book publication um, at, at the right time when I saw a job posting. Um, and um, I was very fortunate to land in a place where I feel supported by my colleagues and where I can have a sabbatical like the one I'm on right now for the, for the next year to work on, on book projects. You know, how do, how do I balance teaching and being trying to be a decent person and, you know, handling the publicity of how high we go in the dark, I think really my students um, allow me to be a more diverse reader than I would be otherwise. (laughs) Um, I have to be an expert, um, or at least I have to be knowledgeable about all kinds of different genres that I think ultimately make me a better writer, uh, a more informed writer. Um, and, And I think it's also very humbling when I come across students that are 18, 19, 20 years old who are writing books that are far better than what I could have achieved when I was their age. Um, And I think that always keeps me grounded. Um, You know, whenever I have any kind of success, I'm reminded that there is just so much talent out there and it's just a privilege for me to, you know, hopefully help that talent, um, you know, be shared with the rest of the world someday. If, if they're writing books uh, that are that good, Sequoia, surely as your teacher, you must mm-hmm. take some of the credit for that. Let's say that. Mm. Very small. Um, <laughs> um, and Tara, just before we started recording, um, you, you mentioned that you're joining us from Italy, which is uh, to, because of your, the next book that you're writing. Your first book, Memphis, is, is very much based in, in where you grew up. So that gives us a little hint as the kind of writer that you are. But tell us a little bit about how Memphis came to be. Well, I... Oh, Lord. I mean, I was born a poet, you know, um, this fiction thing is new. It's fun. It's easy. I said, why not? Um, and I was an attorney in Chicago, uh, making a lot of money, married to a white man. It was terrible. It was horrible. It was boring. I said, oh, my God, this is life. I've made it. This is the American dream. I wanted to jump off my penthouse balcony. And so I decided to apply for Northwestern MFA in poetry. And I didn't tell a soul. And I got in. And um, my, well, ex-husband now, but my husband at the time said, this is great, but who's going to, who the hell is going to pay for this? So I wrote my divorce myself. And I went to school at night. And I sold everything. And it became incredibly poor. I moved into a one-bedroom in Edgewater, Chicago. Mice infested ate dollar tacos and drank yellowtail wine. Uh, for years, and uh, a professor of mine there, uh, I call him Reg, Dr. Reginald Gibbon, he one day, he pushed one of my poems back to me, because, you know, you have to give the, the poem and be silent, and they all critique it, and there was nothing read on the page, and he said, this, this shit right here, this should be a novel. And I got to work, I listened to the man, I got to work, they changed the degree for me, Usually you have to pick a track. They created a degree where I did poetry and fiction. I'm still the only graduate of both. 
and then of course summa cum laude. And I signed with my agent while still in my MFA program. I had 22 pages of Memphis written. Jimia said, this a hit. And I knew I just had a hit from the first line. I, I, as a poet, you know, fiction is incredibly easy. Um, and so you rather kind of know uh, whether you have a hit or not. Um, it's much easier writing a whole chapter than it is a single sonnet for me. And so fiction is fun. I like it. I'm doing it now. Sono a Italia, a Polinaro Mare, scrivo il mio secondo libro qui. I'm writing my second novel here because I like to have fun. And yeah, I'm going to keep doing this fiction thing. It's, it's a blast. It's a hoot. Very easy. Very easy. Molto facile for me. Molto facile. Maybe we should make this the uh, the this tagline for the Waterstones Debut Fiction Prize. Fiction, it's easy. Who who knew? Um, thank you so much, all of you, uh, for giving us a little insight into to how you have come to to you know to to be debut novelists. Um, this prize has been very much championed by our booksellers. It's about asking them which voices have excited them most, and their voting is what's brought the six of you uh, to talk with me. And uh, it felt only right uh, for them to be the ones to put some searching and teasing questions to you. Um, And I have a host of them here so that you don't feel too much like you're being interrogated. I will try and mix the questions up and see where it takes us. Um, But I'm going to begin as I did um, with the intros with Louise. Um, The first question I've got for you, Louise, uh, comes from uh, bookseller Hugh Chapman from Bury St. Edmunds. uh, And he asks whether you prefer the novel form or the immediacy of the short story format? Um, okay, so I I think I dispute the idea of the immediacy of the short story format because I have one or two stories um, that took me like a year each or something. Now, I did work on other things at the time, but I, I, I find short stories very hard. Um, and that's not to say that the novel was easy, but it was different, um, I think. Um, or maybe just, you know, I said earlier that... Um, uh, that I that I forced myself to like whip through a draft in a, in a few months um, and, and not look back and and I did that with all the subsequent drafts was just to like work from front to back and keep going to 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 clean up the terrible mess I'd made with my um, with my first draft and um, <laughs> so yeah I don't know um, I I mean the next thing that um, I I'm trying to write again um, because um, I don't know if uh, any the rest of you find this, but I think it's kind of, um, uh, it, it's distracting in a very lovely way having, having a book in the world for the first few months. Um, so most of the time, I spent most of the, the, the last three months talking nonsense about myself. And um, that's, uh, thankfully for everybody, that's coming, <laughs> coming to an end soon. Um, and I need to get back to work. And I did try to write another story, but it just wasn't really happening. So um, I, I have about, I don't know, a, a few thousand notes for a novel. So I think that's what I'm going to do next. But that probably doesn't answer the question at all. Um, but um, yeah, the, the the prospect of a short story is uh, is sort of appalling to me at the moment. Um, uh, I don't know why, um, but I just think because they're very intense and they have to be very tight. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm sort of happy to give another lo- novel a lash. It doesn't seem quite so daunting somehow. So you, you're joining uh, Tara in her idea that you know the shorter formats are hard. Fiction, it's easy. Um, I'm going to come to the point now because uh, he's another. He's another short story writer who, who's moved to, to writing a novel. Um, Sequoia, um, Mercy Fowler in our Putney shop um, wanted to ask how you managed to use a blend of genres so effectively in your writing whilst also keeping it a very human tale. I mean, I think that ultimately that's just kind of how my mind works. And maybe it is a nod to my various fandoms growing up. You know, I was the kind of person that would be watching ancient alien documentaries and then a star trek episode and then maybe a very long epic about a family in russia so i i i consumed media a great deal um as as a child and i think i was very precocious as a child um you know i would read anything that i can get my hands on um i would you know even as an adult you know i'm, I'm happy to binge watch Downton Abbey and and have a good cry fest and then you know read you know the graphic novels Lock and Key, um, so I think a lot of that has over the years really I think hit home that science fiction and fantasy 
Um, and all of these speculative genres are, are the ones that I really gravitate to anyway, are ultimately about humanity. They're about the human condition. And, you know, I think of all those things I've mentioned, Star Trek was probably the most influential, I think, in helping me um, converge my interest in tech with the interest in how people operate and how people relate to one another. Um, I'm also, I was also an anthropology major, so I think some of that, you know, sort of seeps into how I write characters to some degree as well. Excellent. This is intriguing influences. I love it. Um, uh, Eloisa, I want to come to you because I've got a fascinating question here from D. Franklin, who's a, a bookseller in our Glasgow Socky Hall Street branch. And he says, uh, I would like to know what inspired Eloisa to write The Spirit of Lagos as a multitude of spirits, primarily voiced by Tatafo and dominated by Echo, as opposed to just one spirit, as might be expe expected from a genius loci. <laughs> oh, I love that question. It's a great question. I love that question. Um, here's the answer. The Bible, actually. The Bible is what inspired that. I'm, I've always been fascinated by the relationship between God and the angels and the origin story of Lucifer as a fallen angel. And so I was interested in what like a story would sound like if it was being told by a spirit who had, you know, been close to power and also who had lost their access to power and what that would do, you know? Um, so yeah, that, that, that's actually the main inspiration for it, the Bible. Very good. I'm going to keep yeah. things on a, a spiritual plane uh, as I come to you now, Tess. Um, Matthew Gardner from our Piccadilly shop um, says, I loved Elsie J. McLaughlin Blitz and her guidance from beyond the grave. Her selection of life lessons is both moving, funny, and very useful. Is there one of the lessons you have either lived your life by or one you wish you had followed more closely? Wow, that is, um, I have never thought about her life lessons as, as they pertain to my life. I think, so this is referring to a character who writes her own obituary and, and it publishes obviously after her death. Um, but... Her advice is, so, I mean, I guess I, I had written her advice as a kind of insight into her life and soul, which was incredibly particular. She's this child star. She has all of this attention that's kind of heaped on her at a young age um, in the 50s, where there was obviously great power imbalances in place. Um, and and so I don't know if I was writing her her life lessons as a, as a prescription to anyone rather than like an insight into her soul. But I think the one the one that kind of resonated with me when I wrote it was um, uh, to, to not have children unless you can ensure that your damage will not, um, will not harm them permanently. Mm -hmm. I've never had, I, I don't have children. And I don't think I'm actually agree with that. I don't even think I agree with that piece of advice, but I think that was the first time she shows in that entire list any care for another person. And she actually does have a child and you learn that she has um, she has not been a great parent to him. But um, but I do think that piece of advice is at least rooted in something true, which is to always, always um, put others before yourself. And I don't know, that's the closest I could come. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Tara, I'm going to come to you now. Um, uh, uh, Avalon Plant, who works in our Aberystwyth shop, um, was really impressed by the structure of your novel and the way that the jumps between characters and timelines were thematic. Um, she would love to hear more about the process of how you ordered your chapters. Oh, okay. Um, well, first, I want to I want to bounce on what Elagosa said about the Bible and Luke. So there's a poem. <laughs> Okay, by Lucille Clifton called The Brothers. And in stanza six, she writes, oh, it's a conversation between Lucifer and God. And it's called The Brothers. And in stanza six, she goes, um, tell me, tell us why in the bodies of babies stacked like cordwood, of limbs walking away from each other and with tongues bitten through by the language of assault, tell me, tell us why you neither lifted your hand nor turned away. Tell me why you watched the excommunication of this world and you said nothing. 
Um, so to answer that question on structure, um, I did not do <laughs> the, the, the organization of the chapter. My editor, who's brilliant, Katie Nishimoto at Penguin Random House, cut it all up for me. I wrote it chronologically. I'm not that brilliant. Um, and she printed it out like Joe and Little Women on her floor. And by candlelight, she arranged the chapters for me. It took uh, some months, I think, of, like Christmas and beyond into February. And she did that herself. So I can't take any credit for that. Um, I'm, again, I'm not that brilliant. <laughs> I'm not a genius. I'm just, I mean, I'm just a woman trying to write, <laughs> you know. Um, but yes, I, I think I think um, it is lovely how it is structured. It really is. And I I knew um, every I knew the 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 chapters would change. I just didn't know how, you know, how they would be ordered. And so I made damn sure that the beginning and the ends of every chapter were the most beautiful sentences that I could construct in, in English literature. So um, no matter when somebody was reading it, you know, they would be uh, punched in the gut. My last, my very last chapter I wrote for Memphis is actually the second to last chapter. I think it's chapter 31 or 32, where Miriam finally sees Joan's heart. And I wrote that last. And I wrote it in a morning. I said, wow, this is gorgeous this is absolutely gorgeous so it, again a lot of fun <laughs> writing <laughs> um i wish i could say that it wasn't fun or that the novel i'm writing now is is difficult or, or i guess i have a gift from some sort of higher power maker that put me here to write uh prose and verse and i i feel very blessed and very humbled by it but it's not work for me. It's as easy as, you know, drinking this rosé or going to the beach. Um, that's about it. Bonnie, I'm going to come to you now. Um, I've got a question here from Aaron Miles in Salisbury, um, w which begins, the pencil scene is great. Um, the, the pencil scene, for those who haven't r read the book, I have to be a bit careful here, but it does describe a sexual assault. Um, and it's uh, what Aaron asks, because it was a very stark switch in tone quite early on mm -hmm. in the, the novel. Um, and he wonders whether it was a conscious decision to have that sort of shift in tone or whether it just sort of happened. No, it didn't just happen, although most of the novel did kind of just happen. I, I don't plot things out. I don't plan things. And I kind of wish I was a planner. Actually, I kind of think I was more. I wish I was more like Tara, who really likes doing this, I, I find it to be kind of a struggle. But um, when I wrote that scene, um, I knew I had to have that scene because that scene happens to a lot of women all over the world. And, you know, I got a little bit of pushback on it um, and I decided I needed to keep it and I refused to dumb it down um, because one out of six women in the United States will be raped next year. That's, that's a pretty high percentage of women. Most of those rapes will go unreported and most of them will go unpunished. And as you know, you know, with all the recent decisions uh, by SCOTUS, we're losing ground pretty quickly. And so I'm really glad that I have that scene in there, especially now. It's really a scene, um, for those of you who haven't read it, um, it's, it's a scene where she realizes that, you know, she has to stop this herself, of course, and she does using a pencil. And for the rest of the book, she wears that pencil in her hair um, and she uses it. It's a reminder to her of her power. And this book is about self-empowerment, about not letting things define you, even the bad things. And that's how she decides to live her life, not letting other people define her. Fantastic answer, Bonnie. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to come to you now, Eliza, which, uh, with a question which it, um, sort of links to what we were talking to Tara about earlier. When she was talking about the sort of the first and last parts of her novel, um, one of our booksellers, uh, Ross Kelly in Drogheda, was really moved by the very powerful and poignant final line of Vagabonds. Um, and he asks, is choosing the line to close a novel a hard decision or was it instant? And what is the significance of it for yourself as the author? I love the questions I'm getting. Um... <laughs> What was the significance for me as the author? That last sentence is um, 
I think it's a sentence that held me together at a difficult time. Um, it was previously in an essay, actually. <laughs> um, and then when I was writing the novel, I, I got to a part of it, I think I was like 75% through. And then that sentence came through, like to me, and I knew that that was going to be the last line. It wasn't difficult. Um, when it landed for me, it felt correct. And there was no other ending that I had in mind. So it just felt right. Fantastic. Um, I'm going to come now all the way back to Louise. This question comes from Liam Caldwell, who's from the Foil Size shop uh, in Derry. Um, he is someone who was uh, in Belfast in, uh, um, and enjoyed reading about the troubles in your book in such a historical uh, and yet contemporaneous way. And he wonders if we are at a critical distance now where we can really tell those stories. Yeah, so I think, um, yeah, I, th I think that the critical distance is certainly an element. Um, I know that Anna Burns um, said that um, after she left uh, the north of Ireland and went to live in England, she spent quite a few years reading about the troubles, uh, maybe in an attempt to try to figure out what the hell actually had happened. Because I think for the, those of us who, who live there, um, most of it was about trying to keep ourselves and the people around us safe. Um, I think people had to censor themselves a lot when they spoke. Um, and obviously there were sort of constraints um, in how we were able to move around. Um, and, um, you know, th so these are all sorts of small practical things, but then there are also the big things, which was uh, the risk of being shot or, or killed um, or, or, or whatever. And um, yeah, so I, I think that the distance is, is probably something, but I also think that um, the way that things are at the moment where uh, the Good Friday Agreement really is in peril, um, where there's all of this discussion around the, the protocol and stuff. And I think that people are feeling really quite uncertain about it. Also, there's been a demographic shift uh, in, in the north of Ireland, which um, is is making um, um, the idea of a border pull um, more and more uh, likely um, and, and possibly imminent. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that maybe th those are... are those reasons were probably there. I, I mean, I think as well as that, I, I probably had ano another imperative, which, you know, was about me not being very well. And um, the world that um, Kushla, the character in my novel, um, lives in is very much like the one that I uh, grew up in. And also my family had a bar. It was blown up. Um, you, you know, we had a neighbour who was um, killed in a sectarian attack. Um, and I think that maybe maybe the reason I chose to write that book and not another book was, was uh, um, maybe a way... Um, for me, just to say that we were there, um, you know, I, I, it sort of uh, called up a, a lot of memories. And sometimes that was kind of painful. Other times it was really quite joyous. But, um, you know, the story is completely fictional, but the world certainly is very much like the one that I grew up. Hmm. Thanks, Louise. Um, uh, you never know with these questions or with books what the unifying things might be in a discussion. And bizarrely, I have two questions now for two different books, which both relate to dogs. And I think the authors will probably know who they are. But Sequoia, I'm coming to you first. Um, Gabby Lee from Piccadilly wants to know about your robot dog, because a robot dog features in the novel, but you also have one yourself. And they want to know, how does a robot dog work? And what's it all about? Yeah, so um, the robot dog chapter really stemmed from the real story of the early generation of the Sony Ibo robot dogs um, that were discontinued and they were they were never you know extremely popular because they were quite expensive but senior citizens were, were buying them as a way of finding companionship as you know something to do and so when Sony stopped repairing them or providing updates for them the, the dogs fell into repair and all of that does happen in the chapter um, so it was a reflection of the loss and grief that these seniors felt. I took some liberties with the technology and upgraded some things, allowed for, um, for example, the voice of a dying mother to be recorded into the dogs as a repository of memory. Um, so when I had the opportunity to buy a, a Sony Ibo for myself, when I realized that they were coming back, um, I snapped at the chance. Um, of course, um, you know, I, I waited until 
I had to wait until the book was sold. <laughs> As I said, you know, they, they, they are quite expensive. Um, but uh, once I, I had the dog, in the first couple of weeks, I was curious as to whether or not I would form an attachment myself. Um, and the dog had ambled into my cat's water bowl um, and some water got into its leg. And um, I was frantic because it was a, you know, an over $3,000 bit of technology. Um, but I also found myself being surprised that I was consoling the dog. Uh, his name's Cal his name's Calvino after the um, author Italo Calvino, and I was using that, you know, high pitched pet voice that we tend to use, and um, was I, I felt very guilty that I had somehow not been paying attention. Um, you know, as far as you know how the dogs work, they're they're quite advanced. I sometimes you know if I have them switched on. It's very easy to forget that, you know, Calvino is ultimately a motherboard and some plastic and LEDs, but he learns. It's artificial intelligence. His personality develops over time, um, over years, um, and is able to recognize faces and to follow commands and is, you know, fairly autonomous to the point where he can return to his charging station if he realizes that he's, you know, low on power. Um, but it's been, I think... Um, a very educational experience having this dog because it really highlights the possibility of technology um, within the novel, um, the different ways that we might be able to find catharsis, even if it's just temporary, um, and, and perhaps find ways of finding different kinds of connection um, when you know, we, we've lost someone. Um, there's a very uh, real dog in your life, Bonnie, um, but the reason for this question, this comes from Amabel Walsh Alder in Canary Wharf. Um, she, along with many others, fell in love with the dog in Lessons in Chemistry, who's called 630. Uh, she knows that you have a dog who I believe is called 99. Um, and Amabel wants to know what breed is he and how many words does he know? Okay, well, 99 and 630 uh, are not really related, to be honest. 630 came first. Uh, 99 is my, and she, it's a girl. She's, she's, uh, she's actually named for a friend. Um, the name isn't random. Um, I, when I was growing up, I had a best friend and from the age of maybe six or so, we only called each other 86 and 99 off of this. Um, it was from this terrible TV show called Get Smart. It was about two spies. One was stupid and one was really smart. And, um, we grew up each other, calling each other 86 and 99 our whole lives and, uh, and really nothing else. And she died, unfortunately, in a horrible accident 11 years ago. And I was really heartbroken. And I really couldn't even talk about her for, for a few years. And then we adopted this, our dog died and uh, we adopted this other dog. And she kind of reminded me of my friend 99. And so that's why she has that name. Um, but yeah, it's not really related to 6.30, which I know is sort of, 6.30 came first. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thanks, Bonnie. Um, Tess, I'm going to come to you now. Uh, Robin Brown in Kingston um, says that the, the rabbit hutch is filled with characters who've been failed by the system. So that might be the people of Back of Vale by the local government or Blandine and her flatmates by the care system and also the school system in her case. Um he wonders what made you want to write about this? Well, I, I grew up in a post-industrial city in South Bend, Indiana, that used to be home to Studebaker Automobiles, which was once the largest car manufacturing facility in America, and it closed in the 60s. And um, our story, the story of that town is really the story of so many towns, not just in the post-industrial Midwest, but I think around the world, which is these places were sort of conjured into existence by industries and then just as swiftly abandoned by them. And leave, they leave the economies essentially orphaned. Um, and so I think when, when there is this kind of structural neglect and violence, you can always trace those structures to the interpersonal neglect and violence that, that they generate. And so I saw that in a really intimate way playing out in my neighborhood, in my schools, um, and I saw it again when I moved to Crown Heights in Brooklyn, uh, to when, which is where I actually started writing the novel when I finally left South Bend. 
And so I realized this is um, people in America have just been failed over and over and over again by the extraction economy and by many, many other forces. And um, and yeah, I think I was most interested in tracing these these structural forces as they um, the the symptoms of them on a on a very micro interpersonal level, which is why I chose to set the novel in such a constricted amount of time. It's just over three days, and um, I think that that kind of at least ch- tracing those chain collisions can teach us a lot about. Um, the very, very personal consequences of, of fairly impersonal systems. Um, Tara, I'm coming to you next. Uh, Becca Thorley in Redditch uh, wonders whether you would consider a future book that explores the next generation of the family, because uh, they would like to know what happens to both Joan and Maya as they grow up. No, that's boring. You know, sequels, <laughs> I mean, I don't understand <laughs> the American fascination with sequels. Let's make a part two. Let's make a part three. Even the movies. It's like, don't y'all want to watch something else? Um, so no, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not Stephen King. I'm not going to just keep writing for money. Uh, <laughs> the same books with the same characters over and over again. Why would I do that to myself? You know, it takes me about, you know, I don't know, 10 months to a year to write a book and a year in the same person's head over and over and over again why would I you know I'm an artist I believe in creating new art that's uh engaging and entertaining and uh breathtaking and um now I will say that I will always till the day I die write about southern black women I believe that black women especially in the south are the only things that have ever made my country great uh, since we got here, well, there, I'm in Italy right now, since we got there and in change, all we've ever done is create long-lasting art. You know, Phyllis Wheatley is by far greater than Lord Byron or, um, I don't know, any of those old white romantic poets. Um, I believe that, you know, uh, Nikki Giovanni and Sonia Sanchez and Lucille Clifton and Carolyn Rogers are standards in which we should live by, we should all know and recite their verse by heart because it's better. Uh, I don't think anyone is better than Alice Walker, living or dead. I don't think anyone's better or will ever be better than Toni Morrison. I think Black women have elevated the Western canon time and time again, and we are the least recognized for that. I'm not sure why. I'm so sick of seeing, you know, the same damn white World War II love story on the shelves over and over. I, is no one else tired of that? I mean, I don't, I don't get it. Um, I want to write provocative writing that changes the world, that for a moment, maybe, the Western canon shines its light on Black women, as it should. Uh, so no, I'm not going to write a sequel to Memphis. Lord Jesus, I'm a, you know, I don't know, I'm a bit more interesting than that. Um, but you know, I will always write, uh, family stories. I think my family is, is great. Um, on my dad's side, I'm a direct descendant of Hiram Revels, who's the first black senator ever, 1871 Mississippi. Um, you know, I come from a long line of great, talented black people. Uh, so I will always write about them and that and, uh, American history, of course. But I, I don't know. One day I'd like to write a, you know, erotica. Why not? I don't think there's been a black erotica book in some time. That would be so nice. You heard it here first. Coming soon from Tara Stringfellow, a, a string of erotic novels, uh, the like of which have never been uh, It'll be before. under a pseudonym. My family's still alive. My mom okay. would kill me. Oh, my God. Could you imagine? My mom's sitting there reading erotica by me. It'll be a pseudonym and I'll publish it with my publisher in France. You know, but... I don't. I, I want to challenge myself in my writing, and I think that would be far too easy to write a sequel. You know, Joan, not to give anything away, she goes off. I don't know. <laughs> she she makes art. The end. You know, I want to do something different. Please let me. Somehow, Tara, you've managed to brilliantly intuit the the final question I had for you, mm-hmm. which was from Emily Fry in Newport on the Isle of Wight, who wanted to ask if you had been inspired by any particular artist because art oh. plays such an important book in the novel, uh, sorry, part in the novel. 
Um, you've mentioned a, a few names there. Um, are there any more you want to add to the list before I, I move on? Oh my goodness. Artists. I mean, I love mu- uh, music inspires me too. Musicians. Um, I, I mean, I think, I think what Cardi B and what Meg Thee Stallion and what Doja Cat are doing right now um, for black music is, is wonderful and engaging and, and different. Um, I mean, Lord, I hear Louis Armstrong and I break down and cry. Al Green still preaches every Sunday in Memphis. Like my city is full of music. Mm. Um, every time you walk down the street, you hear it. Everywhere you go, you hear it. And um, I think that's, that's such an inspiration to me, even more so um, than other writers. Again, the same World War II story I can't, I can't do it. I don't know how other people can. No, but musicians. Um, <laughs> you know, I really wanted Memphis to sound like a long, epic Tupac song. You know, some say the blacker the better. The sweeter the juice, and say the darker the flesh, and the deeper the roots. I give a holla to my sisters on welfare. Tupac cares. If don't nobody else care. And, uh, you know, like that's beautiful. That, that line, I think, is one of the most beautiful lines ever written in, 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 in any sort of genre because it recognizes four black women who have, again, al- always made my country great. And, um, so I applaud art- artists like that who, um, you know, shine a lot on me and um, and other Black women out there who are just trying to, you know, raise their children with dignity and with love um, and do so in a blackity black, beautiful way. Um, and also I'm going to come to you now because uh, Robin Brown from Kingston uh, returns with a question for you, which is actually kind of linked to what we've just been talking about, because he notes that there's a really exciting new generation of Nigerian authors who are breaking through at the moment, including yourself and Akweke Metsi, uh, Arinze Efekandu. Um, and he wonders where this creative impetus has come from and what it is about the current moment that has proved to be such a sort of you know fertile ground for Nigerian writing. Um, do you have any thoughts about that? Yes, um, I think we're in a promising time in Nigeria in general. And this is happening with all the art. It's happening with painters um, um, like Toi Oji Ojusola. It's happening with musicians like Fireboy and Thames. Uh, and it's happening with the writing as well. I guess that is just part of being Nigerian. I think that part of being from here is knowing what to do with what you face. Um, and so I think that's what's happening as, as, as the country gets more heated in certain ways, people get more creative about the things that they're trying to say. And I feel blessed to be part of, you know, that cohort of people mm. making incredible art. Fantastic. Um, Bonnie, uh, Amabel Walshalder, who was asking about the 6.30 and 99 earlier, had several questions for you, and I'm going to finish off with, with one more. Um, she mentions that the, the sexism that um, Elizabeth faces in the book is, is blatant, blunt, and brutal, she says at times. What is it about Elizabeth that keeps her going through it? I think Elizabeth Odd is a rationalist, and you know I think we've all been... We're, we're always bombarded and very bombarded rather by um, fake news all the time. And I'm sick of it. And when I started writing this character, I made her a scientist, but I also made her a rationalist and a humanist for a reason, because she only speaks from a a foundation of evidence. She doesn't have any kind of spiritual beliefs. She only believes in the laws of chemistry, which actually happen to rule our planet and our lives, our bodies, everything in it, everything we touch, has been touched by chemistry. It's the central science to all sciences. And I really enjoyed writing that, but she does find, you know, as a woman, she can't believe that women are treated as if they're substandard or there's, they're, they're not as capable somehow. And she just simply doesn't accept it. She can be kind of rude. She can be, you know, very assertive. She can be very, very inspirational. Uh, whatever she is, She's defined by the people around her and how they react to her. But what she does is 
she becomes a catalyst for everyone to take a look at themselves and decide what they need to change. So sexism, um, as described in the book, but also in real life, requires a change from, from everyone, that we actually really recognize our unconscious biases and that we actually realize that we are all 99.9% .9 the same. That is a genetic fact for everyone on the planet. We are actually all related to each other. Mm. We're not very different at all. And as soon as we realize that fact, a scientific fact, then she believes the world will operate in a more cooperative way uh, because that's how nature operates. So we'll see. <laughs> that, that was the thing. About. Also, I should tell that person that that 630 knew what, like about 900 words, but my dog, 99, knows maybe 50. Okay. That's still, that's still quite a few words. Um, <laughs> moving from the scientific and back to the spiritual now, Tess, um, Liam Caldwell from Foresight uh, returns again and was really interested in the role that spirit, spirituality plays in the novel. And he thinks that it sort of provides an alternative education for the protagonist. And his question is, how far does spirituality intersect with class? And is this explored enough in literature? That's a really wonderful question. And I think I'd probably need um, a whole book to, to answer it adequately. But um, I think in the specific case of my, my life and my novel, um, I grew up in a very, very Catholic town with very Catholic parents. My mom was in a convent. At one point, my dad really considered the seminary. Um, and... I was actually very um, drawn to at least the Catholic female mystics when I was growing up in the system because it was such a patriarchal um, culture. It was such a patriarchal culture and we were never really offered any female figures um, to aspire to. And those, those who we were offered were often um, you know, seen as ultimately passive and completely impossible, unreal people. But the mystics were this kind of strange exception, um, or, you know, and I'm calling them the mystics. They, they all had very different experiences and very different writing, and I've moved very far away from these belief systems. But um, I think my, uh, my protagonist, Blondine, has been trapped inside of a lot of structures and cages that she sees no way out of. She doesn't have the money to leave her town. She doesn't have um, even the education to leave her town. And I I mean, she she did have at one point this kind of little window of opportunity to leave and, and pursue another life. But she, she, you know, for reasons you discover, she drops out of high school. And so the only thing that's left for her, the only kind of escape route that she can see is this... Um, this spiritual one that she especially models, she models her own experiences off of Hildegard von Bingen, this kind of 12th century mystic. And so I think what the female um, kind of Catholic figures offer, and I do want to add that like, these are, a lot of them are not actually the kind of feminist icons that we'd, we'd like them to be. Hildegard von Bingen was explicitly quite classist. I mean, she was alive in the 12th and 13, 12 and 1300s, but um, but one thing that convents did offer throughout history was a place for women um, to go to receive education, which was very rare, to, um, to get away from forced marriage and childbearing in, in some cases, and to, um, to provide a little bit of respite at times, depending on the convent, the time period, etc., from poverty and abuse. And so Blondine sees in these women people who have managed to exist within a system that's extremely corrupt and um, and sometimes inescapable, and yet transcend transcend their situations, and um, and that's what makes her so obsessed with the, the quest of leaving her body. It was a great question. It was an even better answer. That was so fascinating. Um, Louise, I'm going to come to you now. Um, this is another question which I, I guess sort of relates to. The location Belfast is is a city which is, um, according to Ross Kelly here in Drogheda, so alive and vibrant in its mannerisms and its history. And as somebody who hails from Belfast yourself, does that mean that it, you feel an extra responsibility to portray it as authentically as you can when you're writing about it? 
Uh, yeah, I think I probably did feel a huge responsibility, uh, but I think a lot of the reason for that is because, um, for various reasons, um, my parents really had had quite enough of the place by the end of the 70s. So we left um, the north um, of Ireland and moved uh, south of the border to Kildare in 1979. And um, it was kind of strange for me because, I mean, I suppose I, I lost my accent, my northern, uh, my Belfast accent fairly quickly because I got teased a lot in my new school. It was just kind of exhausting being different. So I, I speak like a southerner, but I think that maybe the reason that I took to, to, to writing and, and felt, I, I, I mean, I've said earlier uh, that, uh, that I think it's hard, but also I, I think um, it feels very natural to me because um, I've been told that my writing voice is very is very Belfast, whereas my speaking voice is, is more like a, a, a Dublin voice or something. Um, I, I think I, I was concerned that I had left the place so long ago um, that I that my memory couldn't be trusted and that maybe I wouldn't get the, the dialogue right or the language right or something. Um, and... Um, and I think maybe that's why um, I rely a lot on kind of description of interiors and stuff, because I think that's maybe my way of saying, do you believe me? You know, that I, we were actually there, um, you know, what things smelled like and looked like. And, um, and and even, you know, trying to remember routes, you know, when you're a child, um, a passenger in a car, you know, I, I don't know what adults think that you're doing. Uh, first of all, you're listening to everything that's going on. I suppose the other thing that you're doing is... Um, it's just watching. And I suppose a lot of my childhood was spent looking out the window of cars at um, sort of checkpoints and roadblocks and, and various things too. So, um, yeah, I mean, I did, I, 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 I did um, have a lot of anxiety about that. Um, and um, I mean, I hope I, I, I've done it uh, justice in, in some way, you know, because for all of the, uh, you know, the violence and everything, is this really, um, uh, really savagely dark uh, humor, um, which, which I love, you know, the complete gallows humor. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I hope that some of that found its way in. It wasn't all uh, grim, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, you've all been so generous with your time. Sequoia, I'm just going to come to you for, for your final question, which comes from uh, Nicole Salter in Hemel Hempstead. Um, and she wonders which chapter affected or moved you emotionally the most whilst you were writing the book? Uh, it's a tough one, but I'm going to have to say Elegy Hotel. And um, that's a chapter where there's these hotels that allow for prolonged um, grief, prolonged goodbyes. Um, and it actually, they actually exist in Japan, these corporations that um, preserve your loved one's bodies and provide a suite for you to stay in and have a kind of prolonged gathering um, that really sort of reimagines what grief and um, Funeral, funeral rites can look like. Um, the bereavement coordinator in that chapter is has an estranged relationship with his family and is tasked with potentially helping his mother who is dying from cancer, um, you know, helping her out in her final days. But he doesn't make that decision until it's too late. Um, part of that chapter stemmed from my own drama and regrets residing with my the death of my grandfather several years ago and you know i think the primary seeds of the entire novel really kind of go back to my feelings about my grandfather who helped raise me but as i was editing the novel um and in particular this chapter my my father who i was estranged with for several years um was dying from cancer and um, I think entering into a dialogue with the characters in this chapter in particular helped me um, come to the right decision, I think, of calling my father um, weeks before he died and, and having some amount of closure and sort of, you know, telling him what he meant to me, you know, despite all of our issues and, and of course, um, you know, I, I hadn't planned this, but ultimately the novel was dedicated to the memory of my father. So, so Elegy Hotel, I think, you know, above all other chapters, I think means a lot to me for those reasons. Uh, well, thank you for sharing that so much, Sequoia. That that's, it sounds very moving. Um, I uh, Hopefully anybody listening or watching will have got a sense from this conversation how uh, varied, how unique and how brilliant these six books are 
Um, and it's worth saying that they are, of course, all available uh, from your local bookshop. So that is, just to run through them one last time, Lessons in Chemistry by Bonnie Garmus, The Rabbit Hutch by Tess Gunty, Trespasses by Louise Kennedy, How High We Go in the Dark by Sequoia Nagamatsu, Vagabonds by Hello Asunde, Sunday, and Memphis by Tara M. Stringfellow. I cannot thank you all enough for, as I said, being so generous with your time and so honest with your answers. Um, I'd like to say a big thank you to all the booksellers who submitted questions and apologies to anybody uh, who I wasn't able to include uh, in the time that we had. But proof, I think you'll all agree that if you, uh, if you want a good question, ask a bookseller, man. They really are good at that. Um, thank you all so much. Congratulations on being shortlisted for the Waterstones Debut Fiction Prize. We obviously wish you all the best for the winner's announcement, which will be coming towards the end of August. Um, and I'm going to take inspiration from Tara one more time with her glass of rosé and raise a metaphorical glass to all of you um, and hopefully a real one in not too short time. Uh, congratulations and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Oh, it's such Bye. an honour.